The late Christian author Rachel Held Evans wrote, If you are looking for verses in the Bible with which to support slavery, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to abolish slavery, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to oppress women, you will find them. If you are looking for verses with which to liberate or honor women, you will find them. If you are looking for reasons to wage war, you will find them. If you are looking for reasons to promote peace, you will find them. If you are looking for an outdated, irrelevant, ancient text, you will find it. If you are looking, though, for truth, believe me, you will find it. This is why there are times when the most instructive question to bring to the text is not, what does it say? But what am I looking for? I suspect Jesus knew this when he said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. If you want to do violence in this world, you will always find the weapons. If you want to heal, you will always find the balm. I love that quote. I love that sentiment from Rachel Held Evans. There are times the most instructive question we can bring to the Bible is not what does it say, but what am I looking for? We are part of the Protestant Reformation, the Reformed tradition, and that is what being Reformed is about. For centuries, Control of the Bible, the Word of God for all humanity, was the exclusive property of powerful, noble, educated clergy, men. Because of the total depravity of humanity, these powerful men, and celibate men, I should add, I believe they were, they were trying to be faithful, they were, they were trying to be loving, but when they read the Bible, they were looking for ways to maintain control, maintain power and status. They, on some level, were looking for things that would preserve what was familiar and comfortable to them. And so the Protestant Reformation, which was made possible by Gutenberg's printing press, made the Bible available to everyone. Luther translated the Bible into the language of the people. You didn't have to be a student of Latin to be be able to read Scripture. And it took a while, but the ability for women and LGBTQ folks to not only read and interpret scripture for themselves, but to become priests and pastors, that also was obviously a legacy of the Reformation. Now we have biblical scholars and teachers and pastors and priests sharing what God has revealed to them by the Holy Spirit in Scripture, coming from their diversity of perspectives in gender, race, class, culture, and sexual identities. And unsurprisingly, when these people have gone to study Scripture, they were looking for different things than these straight powerful, celibate men were. They weren't looking for justification to keep silent or repressed. And so I believe when we pull out these texts like Song of Songs, we are participating in the legacy of the Reformation. Of course, the Reformation led to other ideas and theologies as well. 
as people have questioned more repressive teachings from Scripture, the church has often doubled down. Many leaders have presented sex and fleshly desires and our bodies and and, and body parts as, as evil things, as dangerous things, as things that we should avoid or at least not talk about. A lot of times the church has pointed a finger at a overly libertine, overly permissive culture to talk about social ills. And I really believe the church has to also look at ourselves at, as the other side of that coin. I believe that we bear the rotten fruits of sexual repression by Christianity, especially women's sexual repression in the form of abuse and secrecy and scandal, in the forms of violence, sexual violence and rage, the church must confess this. The church must repent of this. The church must listen to those voices coming from the margins. We ask why people don't come to church anymore and we don't consider the fact that so much of what church means in the popular imagination is this repressive purity culture that tells you that your desires are evil and that your sexuality, your behavior has to fit in this tight little narrow box. There's a Lutheran pastor named Nadia Bowles Weber and she has a book called Shameless that is seeking to extend the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, to fields of sexuality and desire. She uses this beautiful image of crop circles. She she says, as a city girl, I never understood what the purpose of crop circles were, why why they existed. And and then I, I learned that the pivotal irrigation system, which it revolutionized farming. It made it so much uh, more efficient and effective to have an irrigation system that went in a circle. It's not that they were planting in a circle, it's that they were watering in a circle to help the crops grow. And so what happens is you have this abundant crop that grows in circles with the corners of the field that die or are brown because the water doesn't reach them. That's the way Nadia Bowles Weber writes. It feels about the church's teaching around sex, is that if you happen to be planted in the center, if you happen to be a cisgendered heterosexual person who didn't have sex before marriage, who's only had, it, had sex with your one true love, and you're totally flourishing within that, then the teachings of the church are really okay for you. But so many of us were planted in the corners. We, as a church now, as a church within the PCUSA and and mainline churches, We have, alongside the culture, sort of taking the lead from academics and and, and secular uh, voices, we have deconstructed marriage and gender and sexuality in recent decades, in, I would say, the recent half century at least. We've deconstructed it as something that's not clad in iron, ordained by God, and in black and white. But the difference is the larger culture of academia is content to stop there, 
to deconstruct and to deconstruct and to deconstruct and to take apart and to criticize and to say everything wrong with every perspective. This is what I was saying last week, that we become uh, fearful of saying anything because no matter what we say can be criticized or can be deconstructed from somebody's perspective, that we're afraid to say anything at all. But it is the church's job to reconstruct these institutions again. It is the church's job to say something, knowing that what you say may be hurtful to someone, may be offensive to someone. It might not be right, but you say it, and then you listen, and then you're reformed again by Scripture, and you go back to the Bible, and you say it, and you listen, and you keep in relationship. That's why we confess, and we are assured of God's grace over and over again. That's why we come to church, so that we can continue to have the courage to say things, to ask for forgiveness, and listen, to read the Bible again, and then say better things. So what does it look like to, con- to together construct marriage, to construct institutional uh, practices and theologies around sexuality and identity that don't see sex as an evil thing, which is what the church too often has said, And neither say that sex is the best thing, the pinnacle of existence, which is what our culture so often seems to preach preach to us. But rather that it is a good thing, that it is a gift from God, that it can be a means to experience God's grace and God's love but that it's also a powerful thing. Extremely, extremely powerful. Which is why it's not for children. It's not for everyone. It should not be entered into lightly, but with appropriate reverence and care, but not fear. Song of Songs puts forth the sexualities of men, women, of human beings as real, as causes for joy without judgment, without condemnation. Friends, the good news is so much better than we have been told. If you're feeling uncomfortable right now, I know you're not alone. (laughs) If you're feeling liberated right now, if you're feeling curious right now, if you're feeling like maybe you want to read more of this Bible Study more of this theology. Learn more of this God. Then I think you are in the right place. Thanks be to God. Amen.